Good evening and thank you for attending this CPD talk on a dermatological subject. Uh, pododermatitis is a very common and frustrating problem both in general and referral practice and the aim of this talk is to describe the diagnostic and therapeutical approach to this presentation. The approach to pododermatitis is complex as this condition represents often the result of a diverse disease problem. In some conditions, the feet might be directly affected, and in others, they might represent a clinical sign due to systemic disorder. Often, the condition or the presentation of pododermatitis is uh, um, due to a combination of causes, and for this reason is considered plurifactorial. Additionally, the feet, due to their nature, are subject to physical insults such as irritants, frostbites, burns, and additionally, because of their conformation, the interdigital skin is prone to moisture, maceration, and microbial overgrowth. Due to its complex nature, the diagnostic approach of pododermatitis is very important and, as with all dermatological conditions, is made of several steps, including history taking, a clinical examination, which is divided into a general and then dermatological uh, examination, and, very important, in making a list of differential diagnoses. Only once a reach of diagnosis is made, we should proceed with diagnostic tests chosen based on the clinical presentation and on the list of differential diagnoses. Um, and after the results, the, the differentials should be reviewed until we reach a diagnosis and finally we evaluate treatment options. Among infectious causes of pododermatitis or complicating factors of pododermatitis, um, certainly we should consider the most obvious, such as bacterial pyoderma, malassezia or candida pododermatitis, uh, demodicosis, and slightly less frequently dermatophytosis or sarcoptic mange. At the same time, there are other conditions that are seen less frequently, but still can be part of the problem, including mycobacteriosis, dipnicosis, distemper or viral papillomatosis. Among the non-infectious causes, certainly we have the hypersensitivity disorders with atopic dermatitis with or without a food involvement or less frequently contact dermatitis. And then environmental problems with the most obvious being intertrago or foreign bodies and um, less common but still possible um, irritant contact uh, dermatitis. Finally, there are behavioral issues that can cause um, problems, uh, for example, acrylic dermatitis due to obsessive compulsive disorders. Again, considering non-infectious causes, we have a long list of autoimmune immunomediated conditions. Some of them can be seen relatively frequently, uh, both in first opinion practice and referral practice, and certainly the most important is pemphigus foliaceus, which is described as the most common autoimmune type of condition um, regarding skin disease. Uh, but we can have also cutaneous or systemic lupus and less frequent forms of pemphigus like pemphigus vulgaris, bullus pemphigoid, mucous membranes pemphigoid, conditions such as epidermolysis bullosa, or uh, the spectrum erythema multiforme and drug eruptions. Finally, we have also the um, differentials consisting in uh, uh, vasculopathies and vasculitis, which often will cause damage to the, herb, uh, to the foot pads and um, uh, to the claws, and plasma cell pododermatitis in feline patients. Neoplastic conditions sometimes involved into 
onset of pododermatitis include squamous cell carcinoma, epitheliotropic lymphoma, or muscle tumors, while whether instead paraneoplastic conditions include superficial necrolytic dermatitis, called also hepatocutaneous syndrome, when the uh, systemic disease involves the liver, uh, or nutritional conditions such as zinc-responsive dermatosis, often described in um, Nordic breeds. Finally, we have miscellaneous conditions such as nasodigital hyperkeratosis or vitiligo. The process of history taking is fundamental to drive the attention of the clinician toward the clinical uh, presentation and uh, um, enable him to make a list of differential diagnoses. Among the factors that are very important during the process of history taking is to keep an eye to breed of the patients. For example, there are some breeds of dogs that are obviously more predisposed to um, allergic skin conditions or dogs that are more predisposed to conformational problems, such as, for example, bulldogs or, for example, mastiffs. Um, the age at onset is also important. In puppies, um, the um, genetic condition and all parasitic conditions should be considered first line, while in young adults, most often the conditions or the underlying conditions are allergic conditions, parasitic infections, or nutritional dermatosis. In middle-aged patients, um, the um, group of neoplastic metabolic autoimmune disorder usually becomes more prominent. Uh, gender also plays an important role, and for example, in, in case of entire male cats, um, they are more susceptible to trauma and secondary infections. Lifestyle can also provide um, interesting and useful information. Uh, for example, dogs living in dirty kennels might be predisposed to development of dermatophytosis or parasitic conditions, or dogs, that are in con dogs and cats that are in contact with chemicals might develop irritant um, contact dermatitis or toxic type of dermatosis. Contact with wild rodents um, can predispose to the development of dermatophytosis, both in dogs, especially Jack Russell Terriers and cats. Um, very relevant also the potential history of uh, um, traveling or the geographical location itself. For example, um, dogs living in south of Europe or traveling commonly from south of Europe might be predisposed to development of, the, of leishmaniosis. Um, the diet is also relevant because it might highlight presence of deficiencies or simply might suggest um, the potential of hypersensitivities. And a previous history um, highlighting problems such as gastrointestinal, relan or respiratory problems might also be important. For example, with gastrointestinal problems, um, this might drive our attention towards a allergic type of skin disease, for example, um, food-induced allergies, while in cats with, uh, for example, respiratory problems, uh, we might tend to consider presence of viral conditions. The general clinical examination is certainly the first step um, enabling us to narrow down a list of differential diagnoses. For example, in presence of signs such as vomiting, diarrhea, PUPD, or jaundice, um, we should drive our attention towards the possibility of uh, metabolic syndromes or paraneoplastic diseases, or presence of less common signs such as uveitis, lymphadenopathy, epistaxis, a poor general condition, especially in animals with a history of traveling, might drive our attention towards, in terms of differential diagnosis, towards, for example, leishmaniosis. Um, again, as mentioned previously, um, the signs of respiratory the, the presence of respiratory signs might be particularly important in cats, leading to a suspicion of viral dermatosis. Moving to the dermatological examination, important points to be considered include the lesion distribution, 
in particular if the um, area involved is haired, non-haired or both, whether there is involvement of the claws, of the footpads and how many feet are involved. For example, if you have only one foot, the main differential diagnosis would be uh, consistent with conditions that might cause asymmetrical lesions, such as dermatophytosis or a neotrombicular infestation, a neoplasia or presence of foreign bodies, or in case of um, acrylic dermatitis of obsessive compulsive disorders. When instead multiple feet are involved, other conditions to be considered um, include a vast range such as demodicosis, immunomediated autoimmune type of conditions, paraneoplastic metabolic syndromes. Um, it's important to highlight that when the footpads only are involved, we always should consider immunomediated autoimmune conditions or paraneoplastic conditions, while when the footpads are not involved and we have instead involvement of the haired skin, we are more driven towards a diagnosis of parasitic, infectious or allergic type of skin disease. After focusing the, the attention on the lesion distribution, type of lesion should also be evaluated. Presence of scales and follicular casts is mainly suggestive of demodicosis, dermatophytosis, or in specific breeds, um, less commonly, of sebaceous adenitis. While instead, common lesions such as crusts are mainly suggestive of pyoderma, but can be seen also in dermatophytosis and pemphigus foliaceus. Ulcerations are suggestive of immunomediated autoimmune diseases, but can also be seen in presence of parasitosis such as demodicosis or infections such as, for example, um, um, deep mycosis. And nodules can be due to a plethora of different conditions including pyoderma, demodicosis, neoplasia, um, granulomas due to sterile conditions or due to conformational problems and or idiopathic. The presence of pruritus should drive our attention towards allergies or parasites. Starting from these slides, I'm going to show the uh, clinical presentation of several conditions um, causing pododermatitis. This is a typical case, for example, of juvenile demodicosis in a um, one-year-old Staffordshire Bull Terrier, where you can see we have a multifocal alopecia, erythema, um, and uh, on a close-up you can see, you could see also the evidence of uh, patchy um, hyperpigmentation and comedons. Um, this is a very typical condition of young dogs, um, specifically of mostly seen in some breeds, and um, it is worth to mention, as we will see later um, in the therapeutical approach, that thanks to the arrival of new molecules um, able to um, address this type of parasitosis, the condition is becoming um, generally less frequent. This is a case of dermatophytosis in a elderly Jack Russell Terrier uh, who was also um, immunosuppressed with uh, um, corticosteroids and cyclosporin due to a thrombocytopenia, immunomediated thrombocytopenia. And you can see the presence of alopecia, um, very subtle erythema, patchy uh, hyperpigmentation and comedons. And you can see also um, the alopecia doesn't involve also the one of the feet, but also it involves the face. And you can see that there is some evidence of muscle atrophy um, secondary due to the um, secondary to the uh, immunosuppressive treatment. Here we have a, a young American bulldog with um, a presentation typical of the so-called conformational pododermatitis. Examination of the uh, plantar web of one of uh, um, her feet showed presence of uh, um, some alopecia, some erythema, but in particular is noticeable the presence of um, 
round um, lesions, which are most likely nodules filled with keratin-like material, and of partial fusion of the um, interdigital webs of digits, um, in this case, two and three. Um, this condition is mainly due to the excessive pressure applied onto the interdigital skin rather than the footpads. And on this picture, you can see that this is due to the um, abnormal um, lateral deviation of some of the digits where um, pressure and friction is applied onto the interdigital skin rather than on the footpads. Obviously, the footpads are designed to um, hold weight and to have frictions because they are characterized by thick epidermis with no hair, while the interdigital web is not designed to do this and therefore secondary to the constant friction and pressure you will have the development initially of dilation um, of the hair follicles which is not clinically visible but then gradually these dilated hair follicles will develop into nodular lesions which sometimes are visible on the plantar web sometimes are visible on the dorsal webs like we will see in the next slide and these nodules, with time, again, due to the constant pressure, tends to break into the dermis with release of hair shafts and the so-called foreign body-like reaction. Often, these lesions then become secondarily infected, and therefore, these patients develop secondary deep pyoderma. And here we can see um, the presence of uh, um, nodules visible this time from the dorsal, on the dorsal web. In this case, we have a, a British Bulldog and uh, the lesions involve most of the interdigital skin. Um, it goes without saying that in some of these cases, um, the concurrent presence of atopic dermatitis um, um, exacerbate um, the severity of the clinical signs because in addition to the mechanical problem um, and to the physical um, progression into um, nodules and then for a body-like reaction you have also inflamed skin often with secondary infections And this is another example. This time is not a brachiocephalic breed, is a relatively hairy uh, entire male uh, Labrador retriever where um, uh, there is a similar issue to the American Bulldog we saw earlier with lateral, in this case actually is medial deviation of some of the digits with um, part of the interdigital skin acting as a weight-bearing surface uh, because of the deviation of the digits and of the footpads. This is a very severe case of pododemodicosis in a young Doberman, um, where we have several um, areas of interdigital ulceration. Um, you can see also there are some nodular lesions and uh, um, looking at the ventral aspect of the, uh, f um, of the foot, you can see um, involvement of the interdigital web with noticeable edema um, and uh, ulcerated uh, nodules. Um, very, very interesting, very important to highlight the involvement of the haired skin whilst the non-haired skin, such as the foot pads, is preserved. Instead, here we see a case of a opportunistic fungal infection in a young Springer Spaniel, um, who was presented initially because of ulceration involving his nasal plenum, with um, a list of differential diagnoses that um, eventually included immunomediated diseases followed by onset of ulcerations on the foot pads. Um, following um, histopathology, a fungal element were found in the skin, both in the nasal plenum and on the foot pads. 
and uh, um, interesting factor in the history is that this dog was uh, on treatment with immunosuppressive drugs. Um, it was uh, um, a combination of um, prednisolone and cyclosporin um, due to a immunomediated neurological disorder. Um, this is a middle-aged um, West Island White Terrier uh, presented because of crusting and some superficial ulcerations um, involving mostly uh, the muscle and the periocular area. These lesions were relatively subtle and uh, they weren't very visible because of the long hair coat, but you can see presence of crusts trapped into the hair, um, uh, into the, the hair coat. And among the other signs, there was presence of um, fissuring of the footpads. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, for demodicosis, uh, for the demodicosis, we had involvement of the haired skin, while in this case, the involvement was mostly um, um, on the footpads themselves. Therefore, um, and a diagnosis of superficial necrolytic dermatitis was suspected and um, um, together with the histopathology we recommended performing an abdominal ultrasound. And this is an image of the abdominal ultrasound um, focusing on the liver aspect where you can see this um, typical and uh, relatively easy to uh, notice um, honeycomb or Swiss cheese type of appearance, which suggests the presence of a hypothopathy um, with subsequent um, metabolic issues leading to the um, necrosis in the epidermis. And here we have a classic example of um, pemphigus foliaceus in a middle-aged standard poodle where the lesions are characterized by multiple crusting eruptions affecting the foot pads. In this case, also the herd skin was affected because obviously pemphigus is a pustular disease um, involving both herd and non herd skin. Um, on a and here, a less common but still um, um, possible to be seen um, immunomediated disease of the foot pads. Um, in this case, affecting feline patients called plasma cell pododermatitis and characterized by um, edema of the foot pads, often with presence of these fine scales and in some cases, ulceration of the foot pads. Often, multiple foot pads are involved. Most often, is the tarsal, um, uh, the metacarpal, and metatarsal. However, also the digital foot pads can also be involved. And finally, uh, given that um, um, in the most recent slides we have described conditions that are um, um, not that common, we shouldn't forget that obviously pododermatitis can be caused by much more common conditions, such as, for example, atopic dermatitis. And this is an example in a young uh, American bulldog where the interdigital palmar uh, uh, web is characterized by um, a degree of erythema. Um, you might notice in this picture that the erythema extend um, caudally uh, towards the um, um, caudal aspect of the metatarsal area, uh, sorry, is the metacarpal area. And uh, in the second picture, you see um, that on dermatological examination, um, the erythema uh, quite intense um, along with some alopecia, which is most likely self-inflicted, um, is noticeable on the inner aspect of the front limbs, on the axilla, partially on the sternal area. And uh, although it's not obviously highlighted in the picture, you might notice that there is some erythema of the muscle. Once a list of differential diagnoses have been formulated, Various conditions should be ruled in or out by performing pertinent tests. The tests can be basic tests such as skin scrapings, hair plaques, or cytology, or 
a bit more in-depth tests including bacterial culture, dermatophyte culture, or specifically um, for specific conditions, skin biopsies. Other tests uh, might include, for example, allergy tests, such as a food trial, or um, other tests to be done when a systemic disease is considered, including ultrasound, radiographs, the generic hematology biochemistry profiles, or specific cultures and PCR. Um, more in details, skin scrapings and hair plaques are normally used to rule out demodicosis, so to look for presence of Neotrombicola autumnalis or Elmint larvae. A trichogram, wood lump, a fungal culture um, are useful to uh, rule in or out dermatophytosis, and cytology is commonly used to look for any evidence of bacterial pyoderma, Malassezia dermatitis, or more specifically, if you suspect pemphigus foliaceus, to look for evidence of acanthalytic cells. Um, when a neoplasia is suspected, and we, we have nodular type of lesions, an FA, an, an FNA might be needed. Skin biopsies are normally used to look at features consistent with um, immunomediated diseases. So every time you suspect an immunomediated disease, especially affecting the footpads, um, you, a skin biopsy would be indicated, as well as for neoplastic conditions such as squamous cell carcinoma um, or mast cell tumors. Sometimes um, biopsies can be helpful to rule out demodicosis if demodex mite cannot be identified identified in uh, um, samples taken simply by skin scraping. And sometimes um, biopsies can be useful because um, you might perform special stains for dermatophytosis or bacterial cu culture from tissue culture. Um, usually, uh, depending on the size of the patient, um, um, I use a four to six millimeter type of punch biopsy but in specific cases, excisional biopsies might also be needed, especially if you identify an intact pustule and you want to um, um, excise the pustule without using a, a punch biopsy type of scalpel blade, because by using a punch biopsy, you might rotate it and create some forces that eventually might break the pustule. Um, PCR is used for Legemania, or viral um, dermatosis, and obviously um, um, this is not a place to discuss in details diagnostic imaging techniques, but uh, when you suspect paraneoplastic syndromes um, um, is, is, or other conditions where there is a systemic involvement, imaging uh, can be very helpful. As we said, um, on non-haired skin, um, the approach with skin biopsies can be essential, um, especially for looking at features consistent with immunomediated diseases, nutritional dermatosis, for example, zinc responsive dermatosis, paraneoplastic metabolic diseases, or conditions that ca cannot be diagnosed by simple cytology, or often cannot be diagnosed by simple cytology, such as deep mycosis um, or deep bacterial infections. And as we said, it, you might use four, six meter, four to six millimeter punch biopsies, or um, you might uh, do an excisional biopsy. When dealing with lesions affecting haired and non-haired skin, and systemic problems um, are suspected because um, these have been highlighted on the general examination, it is really important to carefully review history and general examination and uh, review the presence of PUPD while loss or, in, or inappetence. Ancillary tests very important in these cases might include a blood work, urine analysis, as we said previously, specific bacterial fungal culture, or if you suspect um, um, Leishmania, Leishmaniosis, um, you can do PCR from lymph node aspirates or ELISA serology. Uh, when cryptococcus is uh, suspected, um, then you can also perform serology. 
Um, diagnostic imaging technique, as mentioned previously, should be done when you suspect a paraneoplastic disease, but don't forget that um, specific techniques such as a CT or MRI scans can be useful to um, uh, highlight eventually the presence of foreign bodies uh, that might have either that might either be present on site where the lesions are or might have migrated um, uh, along the affected limb. Um, when you do all these tests and uh, um, you you obtain a negative result and you still um, have a patient with the presence of systemic signs, you should then consider uh, paraneoplastic diseases or nutritional dermatosis. From this slide onwards, we are going to review briefly treatment options of different conditions causing pododermatitis. Let's start with demodicosis and with the most um, simple form, localized demodicosis, which is normally seen in uh, young um, animals. And uh, usually there is no necessity to treat it because 90% of the cases will resolve spontaneously. We suggest monitor and performing skin scrapings every four to six weeks until you have resolution. And if instead the number of mites increases, then you might consider starting treatment. Traditionally, treatment of generalized demodicosis um, consists in many molecules, um, some of them licensed, such as, for example, antred steps, other um, licensed in forms of spot-on, such as moxibetin spot-on, and other non-licensed, uh, for example, oral ivermectin, oral mirbemycin, uh, oral moxibetin, subcutaneous doramectin, um, or in cats, 2% lime sulfur. Um, as mentioned previously, the advent of new molecules has now changed the landscape with a, a very easy treatment and very effective treatment for this condition. The first of the new compounds uh, called the isoxazolines uh, was a fluoralanar uh, marketed as Bravecto and uh, this was the first demonstrating efficacy against the demodicosis. Um, shortly after other molecules have been marketed and trialed and proven their efficacy in the treatment of generalized demodicosis, including afoxolaner, which is Nexgard, sarolaner, simparica, and lotirana, credilio. Uh, we recommend that uh, um, during treatment with these molecules, um, skin, scrapings, skin scrapings are continued to be performed roughly um, every, every four weeks uh, to monitor and make sure um, they are um, effectively treating the condition. Treatment of dermatophytosis consists in both um, topical and systemic medications. Uh, topical medications are licensed um, in dogs, for example, anilconazole, and not licensed in cats. Um, shampoos instead are licensed for treatment of dermatophytosis in cats when used in conjunction with systemic molecules um, and are not officially licensed in dogs. Lime sulfur again is not officially licensed in the country but uh, can be useful especially when treating localized forms. Generally the most effective treatment for dermatophytosis is um, uh, the use of systemic molecules. Um, the most commonly used are the azoles, including itraconazole, which is the only licensed treatment for dermatophytosis in cats, uh, or ketoconazole. Um, when using ketoconazole, it's important uh, to remember that um, liver enzymes should be monitored because of the risks uh, of the risk of a hepatotoxicity. Um, other drugs not licensed include terbinafine and um, grisofurvin, which is no longer licensed because of the um, several issues, including side effects. Treating bacterial pyoderma um, is based on 
uh, first of all, topical therapy, which is um, highly recommended, should be the first line. And uh, according to studies, there is good evidence for efficacy of chlorhexidine-based products and benzoyl peroxide-based products. Um, when topical therapy um, is less effective because of presence of deep pyoderma, um, systemic treatment should be considered. And uh, we should remind that um, there is currently a lack of adequately sized blind and randomized controlled trial comparing various antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics, um, if possible, should be chosen based on um, cultural sensitivity results. And as I said, treatment with systemic antibiotics should be reserved when dealing with deep pyoderma rather than surface or superficial pyoderma. When treating malassezia pododermatitis, again, as for the bacterial pyoderma, um, the first line is topical therapy. And there is good evidence for recommending the use of a 2% myconazole nitrate, 2% chlorhexidine gluconate shampoo twice weekly for three weeks, and then the case should be reviewed and treatment continued or changed in frequency or discontinued upon the clinical evolution. Um, when topical therapy is not possible, the use of ketoconazole or itraconazole can be recommended with fair evidence of efficacy. Obviously, um, when doing this, uh, potential issues uh, related to um, side effects, including hepatotoxicity, should be discussed with the client. Uh, treatment of uh, um, sterile interdigital granulomas, um, secondary in most cases to conformational pododermatitis with or without um, other underlying causes, for, such as, for example, allergy, is complex because of the plurifactorial nature of this condition. Uh, it is obviously important, if possible, to identify and address underlying problems. However, sometimes this is not possible and it is important to approach the cases by doing symptomatic treatment, by doing, first of all, um, by addressing any bacterial or fungal infection if present, by using, um, once the skin um, is not infected, using bombs to try to prevent uh, friction between the different surfaces of the interdigital skin, and use protective boots to protect the exposed interdigital skin from harsh ground. Medical therapy can be useful using anti-inflammatory medication, traditionally corticosteroids, but cyclosporin can be highly effective. And there is some evidence that oclacitinib, um, Apoquel, might also be helpful. Uh, when uh, uh, preventative measures addressing the underlying problem or anti-inflammatory medications are not effective, then uh, alternative options include the laser a surgery or fusion podoplasty. For the treatment of immunomediated autoimmune diseases, um, traditionally um, is important to consider the use of immunosuppressive doses of oral glucocorticoids, which often are started alone and once um, remission is induced, they are added with other drugs used as a sparring medication um, with the aim of decreasing and, if possible, stopping the corticosteroids. Sparring drugs include often cyclosporine, azathioprine, chlorambucil, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, morphetil, and um, um, in some cases, um, the use of oclastitinib might also be helpful. When dealing with other autoimmune diseases, um, which are similar to pemphigus filiaceus, the treatment is pretty much the same. is a, is a initially oral glucocorticoids followed by the sparring medications. However, in some cases, topical therapy alone might be helpful. For example, using topical tacrolimus, or um, um, can be helpful using immunomodulatory properties of the combination of doxycycline or oxytetracycline and niacinamide, or in cases of vasculitis, using pentoxifiline.
it goes without saying that when instead dealing with nutritional conditions such as zinc responsive dermatosis zinc supplementation is the treatment of choice and might be required for life um, there are different forms of zinc available um, and the dosage varies based on the form used because of the different absorption uh, personally my preferred choice is to use zinc picolinate roughly at around one and a half milligram per kilo once a day uh, when oral supplementation with zinc is not effective um, intravenous zinc supplementation is reported to be of benefit however there is risk of cardiac arrhythmia um, there is also anecdotal evidence that treatment with essential fatty acids and prednisolone might speed the clinical response, perhaps increasing the absorption of zinc, but this is uh, quite unclear. Um, concurrent usage of antiseborrheic shampoos can be helpful or antibiotic or antifungal um, might be necessary to control secondary infections. Um, often we try to use topical antibiotics and topical antifungal. One of the conditions that we've mentioned previously um, is a superficial necrolytic dermatitis or hepatocutaneous syndrome when the condition is, in, is um, caused by um, hepatho, um, um, a hepatopathy. And um, the treatment is normally symptomatic and consists in treating secondary infractions if present and uh, um, usually when the problem is due to a liver condition um, palliative therapy is done by using oral amino acid supplementation um, as well as zinc and fatty acids high level of high uh, protein contact diet can be helpful and um, a typical example is to add cooked raw egg yolk uh, for example, three to six per day as a source of amino acids of a high quality. Uh, I mentioned that this is uh, obviously the condition is called the hepatocutaneous syndrome when um, the liver is involved. However, um, a clinical manifestation of superficial necrolytic dermatitis can also be caused by presence of glucoganomas. And in these cases, the removal of the mass might lead to remission of sign and might help um, increasing the amino acids concentration. Obviously in these cases um, as amino acid supplementations might also be helpful. Finally, uh, when treating um, lesions that are self-traumatic in nature, in nature um, it is important to address the underlying problem and uh, it's not the scope of this um, um, presentation to describe in details what to do but generally if the underlying problem is an allergy then management of allergy is important um, obviously if we have parasitic conditions they should be treated uh, and if we have the less common issues of neuropathic underlying problems or behavioral problems this should also be addressed appropriately I would like to thank you for your attention and um, Additionally, um, I would like to highlight once again how um, important it is to have a step-by-step -step approach with this condition because of its multifactorial nature in terms of etiology and because of the very diverse clinical presentation. It is therefore important that uh, before considering any treatment option, um, the condition and the presentation is approached in a step-by-step -step way by analyzing the clinical signs, analyzing whether there is systemic involvement or not, analyzing whether there is involvement only of the haired skin versus only the non-haired skin versus eventually um, involvement of both and uh, um, analyzing whether there is a presence of um, various clinical signs that might recommend um, different test options. Um, in other terms, it's very important that um, once an examination is done and the history is taken, a list of differential diagnoses is made and only based on the list of differential diagnoses, then 
diagnostic tests are chosen and performed. Thank you again for your attention.